Thanks. So can you can you guys all see my screen now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Excellent. All right. So um, thanks for the introduction. I wear quite a few hats at Virginia Tech because I'm the kind of person who likes to do a lot of things all the time. Um, so I'm running a lot of different programs. Uh, my, a lot of it is around technology and transportation, but uh, I also teach entrepreneurship and tech strategy on campus and I use that as a method to poach all the smartest, brightest students and bring them over to VTTI. Um, <laughs> but I also really enjoy entrepreneurship. I took a stint for a few years running uh, some startup companies in the West Coast. So I came here to Virginia Tech in 2003, was here for about nine years, and then um, did some West Coast startup companies and, and some entrepreneurial adventures. And then I came back here to help with the advancement of transportation again. Oh, and also because, of course, um, this is a beautiful place to raise your family. And I have three children. They're eight, six, and four. And when I moved back four years ago, it was really to make sure that I had a good spot to raise the kids in, too. So it was a nice little um, match coming back here to VTTI. So a little bit about VTTI. Our mission is focused on saving lives, time, money, and protecting the environment. And, you know, VTTI has been around now for about 32 years. We started as a center within the, um, the university and, you know, with a handful of staff and students and faculty. And now um, we have about 550 employees. We have 10 buildings. We've got a footprint um, down here in Southwest Virginia, in uh, Southern Virginia. We have a footprint up in Northern Virginia. And we have um, researchers and staff in California, state of Washington, Colorado, Michigan, um, a lot of different places. So we've really grown. This year, we um, hit $50 million in awards. And we, on average, probably expend about $45 million each year. So, you know, we're, we've surpassed a third of a billion dollars in revenue bringing into the area. And um, the sky's the limit. We're only growing even with the pandemic that's, uh, that's hit us all right now. So it's because we're so large now, it's a little bit difficult to try to go through and discuss everything that we do. We have centers involved in pretty much anything you can think of, pavement to teen driver research to automated vehicles to weather, kind of all, everything. But if you went out to talk to um, research sponsors and companies about what our reputation is, I think these two kind of nail the big ones. And that's that we're known for um, publicly collecting real world data um, and analyzing it to improve safety. We have over 70 million miles of driving, over a million hours of driving um, all over the roadways and in many different countries. And that's a big portion of what we pioneered and, and stood on, um, stood ground on. And then the other one is that we're known for being able to do confidential kind of proprietary research for car companies and tech suppliers. And that's a big deal because a lot of universities um, are required to publish the, their work. Uh, but what the way we're set up is where we can actually do proprietary research for say GM or Ford or Toyota and not have to share that. So they trust um, us in doing the research we do because we won't, you know, let share the, the results and the things that uh, in that way that they can be competitive against each other. So um, that's another big portion of the trust that we've developed over the last 30 years. So we have, um, oops. we have a pretty um, large test track facility now. So I'm sure many of you are aware of the Virginia Smart Road and, the, and all the politics and, and the chaos from back in the day when we built the road to nowhere, so to speak. <laughs> um, that's the gray here on this, on this uh, slide. It shows the highway section. And since then, we've extended it to this live roadway connector. So it's about two and a half miles long now. Um, we've done over 30,000 hours, I think, of research on this road. And like I mentioned before, it was a, the whole thing was a $50 million investment. 
but the return that we've had since VTTI has gotten started has been close to probably 400 million into the area. So um, the newer areas that we have is this new blue area called the surface street expansion. And what this is a new is a new urban kind of suburban layout that we're able to do more city type of uh, research on. And then one that we're um, painting lane lines on now is this rural road expansion in the green. And what we've done down here in Ellet Valley is, is been able to create a two lane rural road that goes in and out of the trees and the embankments. Uh, and the idea here is that most of the vehicle testing, especially with automated vehicles, is being done on highways and city streets. But the majority of all of us live in the US in rural areas and we ride on those quite often. So eventually these systems are gonna to need to be tested in rural roads. And so we've built a very controlled, safe rural road test track. And what we've done is been able to combine all these three together is we're the only place in the world where you can test your vehicles on highway, um, city and rural roadways all in one facility. So we're really excited to open that up next month. So here's some things that you're probably aware of and I'll kind of quickly go through these and I will of course share the slides later so you can go back and look. Um, but we've done a lot of research on the Virginia Smart Road. Uh, it's outfitted with everything you can think of un under the sun, fiber communication, wireless technology, 14 pavement sections. We had differential GPS. It's just you know outfitted to really uh, give us everything we need from a highway standpoint. We can create weather. So um, that was the big thing when the Smart Road was launched and it's still a big deal today is we have we can create rain, fog, snow, and ice over a portion of the roadway. And it's also overlapped with a variable lighting section. So we can recreate 95% of the overhead roadway lighting. And by putting all those things together and overlapped with each other, um, we really have what I kind of call like a playground for researchers and adults, like a Chuck E. Cheese for adults with regards to testing out vehicles and technology, because we can recreate weather very consistently over and over again. The only thing we can't do is stop it from raining naturally. And so sometimes that's a problem. If we could get a roof over the entire smart road, I think that would probably be beneficial to us. But uh, for now, um, it's very powerful on piece of uh, piece of roadway. We do a lot of vehicle testing on the roadway as well. So we put technologies and systems into really kind of crazy scenarios. Uh, we put So another thing that we have here is the surface street. And this is kind of a, a smaller town based kind of idea. And what we did is we wanted, we kind of wanted to build a module, almost Lego based um, urban environment so that we could change it very quickly. So the idea here is that a lot of the companies we work with, we ask them, do, you know, do you need a truly city looking landscape, right? Do you need fake buildings that look like stores? Um, how real do you need it to look? And they said, it's more about function. So they suggested we build some kind of portable reconfigurable uh, kind of blank canvas. So what we can do with this roadway is we can put roundabouts in, we can pull up the lane lines and change the directions of the road. We drop shipping containers in different locations to create buildings. And uh, we have a lot of other kind of temporary things we can toss on. So we can recreate an entire kind of urban environment for testing some of these vehicles within an hour or two. And this is just kind of a quick example of us putting up a fake sidewalk and fake bus 20 acres. Uh, the goal was not to really kind of wipe the land clean, but to just put roadways that kind of follow the natural curvature and contour of the road. And that way we can put people down in Ellet Valley on, on this track and have them really feel like they're right, driving a, a roadway that was built in 1965. Uh, we want potholes. We want, you know, no lane, um, some of them having no lane lines. And we want this to be a really kind of challenging road. This is just kind of a little snapshot of it from a digital aspect, just to show you kind of the altitude and elevation. Other thing is that, um, we have the uh, Northern Virginia area as we call the Virginia Connected Corridors. So up there, I mean, obviously we have the smart roads down here, but we've got real roadways outfitted with real technology, with vehicles that are outfitted with technology, uh, intersection lights um, out there in the real world. And what that does is it becomes kind of this real world test bed. We have our own VCC cloud 
uh, software that allows us to dial in and see cars moving through the, these environments. Um, we can make changes to speed limit signs. Uh, we can see when intersections are gonna go green or red. And we do a lot of this work for VDOT. Um, a big thing that we're working on with VDOT right now, leveraging this is looking at work zones and trying to find ways to help make work zones safer, both for the workers as well as citizens trying to drive through them when they pop up, when they're temporary or when they're more long-term. So this real world test bed has been very powerful for us to do demonstrations and try out new systems um, and make sure they're ready for full deployment. So earlier I mentioned that we're known for doing kind of real world driving um, data and putting things out in the public. And we pioneered something called naturalistic driving and what this is, is that we have thousands of participants across lots of studies with scooters, trucks, cars, motorcycles, bicycles, everything. And we outfit somebody's volunteers to be part of the study. We compensate them with gas money or let them have a car for a year. And basically we say, okay, um, go ahead and drive like you normally would. And every three to six months, we'll come pick up some data. And basically we just send them out into the real world. Um, after a few days, everybody just falls into their normal behavior. And what we do is very similar to doctor patient confidentiality is that all that data is protected and we keep it here safely secure in house. And we kind of de-identify it from the actual individual. And this allows us to see people drive how they normally would. And when they get into crashes, we can back up and look at the video before we can look at um, the sensor data that we're collecting before, and we can figure out what actually led to these crashes. And this is where all of the driver distraction and inattention research and laws and findings came from, was from here in the New River Valley in our natural six studies that we do. So it's very powerful kind of data. Uh, I'm gonna show you some examples of some videos here in a minute of just the forward video. It's not the best video because we've trimmed it down and, and some of these videos are from really the last 15 years. Um, but it shows you just how powerful some of these, some of this data can be in trying to recreate and look back at what actually led to these crashes. Until the studies like this that we were able to provide, um, all the laws and everything really relied on police accident reports. So police would have to come and investigate and just ask people and try to figure out what happened. Uh, but you can imagine not everybody is accurate in, in providing what happened. There's not a lot of information to really truly understand. And people don't always tell the truth also. So this has been probably one of the most powerful kind of studies um, and really research methods that have been put out. So at this point, what I'll do is ask if you can stop the rec uh, resume recording now. Okay. So what we do is we take all of that data and we fuse it with other video views of a person's face, their feet, how they use the steering wheel, front and back and sides of the car. And then we collect a massive amount of data with radar data, um, brake pedal usage, turn signals, accelerations, speed. And we put that all together. And then we set up algorithms that go through the data to look for what we call triggers. So things like um, if somebody does a really hard break, um, our data is gonna flag that and it's gonna ask one of our hundred reductionists who sit in labs to go look at something just like this and then annotate the data to say what is really happening here. And then once we've done you know, millions and millions of miles of annotation, our team and our statisticians, we can do a lot of analysis to figure out patterns of what's going on, risky roads, risky behaviors, and uh, so we built this software to help us do that. Uh, earlier, I think I mentioned that we also have a footprint in Alton, Virginia, um, near Danville. And what we built there was this, at the beginning it was called the, the National Tire Research Center. And we built a $10 million tire testing machine that could test tires upwards of 200 miles an hour. So it's the only machine in the world that can do this. And then since then, we've, able, we've been able to, you know, it was joint, jointly funded from Virginia Tech, um, GM, General Motors, and also some money from the tobacco um, industry, so uh, Tobacco Foundation. 
And so what we've done is been able to create a new company down in that area that's more higher paid kind of high tech jobs that would help the economy. And so since then we've been able to create two other divisions of it. One is a motion is a vehicle motion lab um, doing some interesting kind of dynamics testing, even with race cars. And then the most, uh, the newest one, which I work with a lot is the design and integration lab. And they do a lot of simulation and really kind of heavy computational processing that help us with automated vehicle work. So this is an affiliated company of Virginia Tech and kind of our first spinoff out of VTTI. And we're kind of excited about it because it continues to grow, continues to do a good job of five to $10 million a year that they're bringing into Southern Virginia. So we also do a variety of other stuff. Um, anything from checking out electric scooters, e-scooters on campus. Um, we've got a low speed urban shuttle that is an autonomous shuttle that goes from down on Industrial Park Drive. It'll, it'll go about a half mile to take people from the bus stop up to the VTTI headquarters. And so this is something we're testing. We're looking at accessibility with it. We're looking at how people can get on and off it with wheelchairs. Uh, we're looking at ways that they can understand where they need to sit and how they stay safe. Um, this vehicle does, doesn't go over 12 miles an hour, uh, but it is one of the first kind of automated vehicles that truly is out there and being deployed on certain roadways. And of course, everything we have has to be hokey colors. So <laughs> even the scooters. <laughs> so I'm gonna pause really quick before I get into the autonomous, autonomous vehicle, uh, vehicle section. Um, is there any questions that anybody has right now about VTTI in general? And you don't have to ask now, we can wait till the end, but I figured it'd be a good time to pause. Yeah, so if anybody, I have folks on, on mute, but you should be able to unmute or just kind of raise your hand and we can, if you have any questions. Okay, well, <laughs> I'll go ahead and dive into the autonomous vehicle section then and, um, and get into some fun stuff about what's going on in this space. So um, a lot of people are wondering, I think, really what is driving this interest in robotic vehicles and autonomous vehicles. And I think the biggest one is that it has a potential to improve safety. And the reason for that is that as good as humans are, and we are very good, um, Average drivers are very good and safe drivers are extremely good. Safe drivers will go their whole life without a police reported crash. Um, but the problem is, is that humans are fallible in some areas. Some things we're just not great at, like being vigilant. Um, we have trouble with getting tired. We have trouble with getting distracted. It's just part of how we are, um, especially in kind of mundane situations. So a big reason why we have you know, upwards of 40,000 deaths each year in the US on our roadways and, you know, millions of crashes. Um, and then worldwide, we have about 1.25 million fatalities a year due to transportation. It's because, for the most part, the human element and what we're contributing um, to the issues. So we have errors that occur, we're fallible, and that is what leads to most of the problems that we have. Some studies have indicated over 90% of our crashes involved the human to some degree, that it was their some at fault or they contributed to the fault. So when you take something like an autonomous vehicle, has the ability to make decisions faster, does not have the reaction time that sometimes it takes humans to have to see something, process it, take their arms and feet and then react accordingly. Um, and then you give, and you know, a robotic vehicle wouldn't get tired in theory. Um, they would never blink. And they might have, instead of just two eyes, maybe they'll have six or 10 or the equivalent of a hundred eyes with certain types of sensors. And so the hope is, is that if we can take a driver out of the loop where it makes sense to and have a robot step in, this may be the first time in a very long time that we can really take a chunk out of the fatalities that we have. We're talking 10 or 20,000 lives a year that we could be saving and millions of crashes. And that's kind of a big deal. And so that's why the biggest reason why VTTI and our team are trying to work in this space is to improve safety. 
there's also some other benefits too. Uh, you have the ability to mitigate traffic congestion by having the vehicles understand each other and be able to drive a little bit more harmoniously. Uh, there's another benefit of increasing mobility. So people who can't drive anymore or people who are disabled or have uh, visible, like vision issues, if they had an automated vehicle available, they could actually go out into the world more. And I think mobility is another really cool benefit that this could provide us. And then the fourth one is really being able to offset kind of some negative environmental effects that transportation has. Because the more and more we get to advanced vehicles, the more efficient they'll run and usually moving to more electric vehicles. So we'll have less of the internal combustion engine and all the pollution that kind of comes along with that. So those are kind of the big four. The way a, a self-driving car works is right now it's got a plethora of sensors on the vehicle. So it's got cameras that go ahead and look out on the forward roadway. They look for lane lines. They look for changes in color of intersection signals. Um, and so cameras are something that are being used. Also radars. So we have radars in the corners and the front and the back of the vehicle to sense where other large objects are. And then there's something called LIDAR. And what LIDAR is, is essentially anywhere from 32 to 64 to 128 lasers that are just spinning consistently on top of the car. And it's creating basically a three-dimensional map of the world. And it's layering that that it's sensing over already stored maps of the world so that it can try to understand in any situation where something is in relation to the car. So I like to show this video from Waymo. And I'm not gonna you know, talk over it or, or you don't really need the audio, but I think what's cool about this is it kind of shows what it might be like if you were an automated vehicle seeing the world. Um, so it slowly starts to add in some digital overlays. Overlay. So you can start to see what we call a cloud point and where you can see these lasers are hitting people and cars and it starts to see things almost like in the matrix, right? So <clears throat> it's moving along. Obviously the cameras are distorted here, but it shows you how it might see all the objects as it moves through. Obviously higher than the top of the vehicle is irre irrelevant for an object because it's not gonna hit something above it. And then it goes through and it's identifying things and recognizing them like cars, locations, predicting where they think they're going to go. It's identifying the turn signals, uh, the traffic signals, the pedestrian signals, and it's interpreting everything that's going on. It needs to know not just that there's a car there, but these cars are going what direction and what are they probably intending to do and what can it predict that it's going to do? Is it going to turn? Is it going to go straight? Is it going to stop for that pedestrian? So these automated vehicles have to process a ton of information uh, in a very efficient way. And obviously the human brain is really the best computer that's out there. But because we've finally come so far along with computer technology is that we're able to process things like this um, to the degree necessary for a robot to be able to navigate the environment. There's still a lot of work to do on this, but this is really um, happening right now in a lot of R&D and test vehicles many of which we're testing here at VTTI. So here's a video that somebody took on YouTube of a Tesla, and this is a vehicle you can actually buy today. So you'll notice that he's not driving, he's going on the highway at 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. And they're doing a lot of things that we already have seen people do in natural stick studies, but we anticipate this will happen even more with automated vehicles. Um, having snacks, I don't know about sword fights, that seems a little bit overboard, um, but I think they wanted to demonstrate that they could do pretty much anything they wanted while riding in this Tesla. Now this isn't a fully autonomous vehicle. This is a lower level automation. So we call this a level two out of five levels of automation. And that's that it will keep you in the lane and it'll keep you from hitting vehicles in front of you. Um, but it can't navigate through intersections. Um, it can't stop and go it, um, when there's not a car in front of it. So to some degree it is limited. 
And that's an important distinction to make because when the vehicle has an issue, it needs to be able to turn the control back over to the human. Now, if the human is not engaged in the driving because they decided to take a nap and the car needs to turn over control to you, it's gotta be able to wake you up. You have to be able to wake up, figure out where you are, get to a position where you can take over. And so right now, that's um, a tough thing to do. And so we are seeing a few little issues with this lower level automation that's happening. And so that's why we'll talk about some of the challenges. So you can see here, I've got a little snapshot of different, um, different challenges that an AV has. One is going underneath bridges and things. You can lose some signals um, when you might need mapping data, for example. Uh, when it snows um, or rains heavy and you can't see the lane lines, that's gonna be pretty tough for an automated vehicle. Uh, if any of you have been on campus, really any campus, but especially Virginia Tech, uh, you pull up to a crosswalk and about 3,000 students are walking across it and they never stop and they just keep going, that automated vehicle might sit there for quite a long time because it's not really going to be programmed to try to really push students to stop. Um, we have traffic circles or roundabouts. Uh, automated vehicles are good at finding their way into them, but it's really hard for them to find their way out. Uh, honestly, it's kind of like most Americans, let's be honest. We're not very good with roundabouts to begin with. Um, and then there's some other things on here like tunnels, uh, pop-up work zones when the lane lines are what the vehicle is trying to focus on. And then when a work zone comes up, those lane lines are still there, but then all of a sudden you have barrels and barriers that pop up and that makes things very difficult for the AB to figure out which it should pay attention to. So a lot of times when people ask, so when are we gonna have self-driving vehicles then? Um, I try to tell them that this is really more of an evolution, not a revolution. So there's not, with all the hype that the media is pushing, this isn't something that's just gonna be next year and all the cars are gonna be automated. This is gonna take a long time. And I think there's uh, three kind of big influencers of this. Uh, one of them is that manual driving is fun, first of all. The U, uh, especially Americans, they, we love to drive certain vehicles. We love to ride our motorcycles. BMWs are created so that you drive them. And there's a culture with America, you know? There's a, it's an extension of your personality to some degree, the cars that you, you buy. So I think that we're always gonna have manual driving to some degree. Um, and so that's gonna kind of play a factor in how fast this, this happens. Another thing is that some of these systems on the automated vehicles can take upwards of 27 to 35 years before we can get them on all of our cars out there on the roadway. You know, how many of you guys own a car that's over 10 years old right now? And I'm sure probably most of us do have at least one that's old. And so sometimes it's going to take 10 to 15 years before somebody trades in their vehicle. And they're not always going to just buy a brand new one. They're not going to might buy a used one again. And so it takes a long time to get vehicles that are currently on the road to be off the road for the new ones to come on with, with these systems. And then the third one is risk perception and really public perception of robots. And that's the one I'll probably jump to for us to talk about. So public perception of automation is all over the board right now. If I were to really survey all of you before my presentation today, I'm pretty sure that about 70% of you would probably say, I will never ride in a self-driving vehicle. There's no way you'll put me in a robo taxi, for example. Um, and that's pretty much how most of America is. The only, there's only one or two generations like millennials um, or Gen X that are really focused on, or Gen Z, that are focused on, they'd be open to it. So a big reason for this is that people haven't experienced it yet. So I kind of like the slide because it kind of shows people at different stages, right? The top left, you've got somebody hovering their hands while the steering wheel is steering you down the road. The top right, you've got this um, dapper looking gentleman reading his book, pushed away from the steering wheel. So he's got, you know, he's got some trust. This bottom left picture, um, these people turn their seats around and they're basically probably having a conference or a meeting um, or some coffee. 
or you're in this middle one down below, which is kind of this utopian future where you buy your self-driving vehicle and you and your partner get free uh, turtleneck sweaters and you lay back and you just <laughs> drive off into the future, right? But in reality, what's going on right now is this bottom right picture, which is like a roller coaster ride where everybody experiences it differently. This, you know, one person's fearing for her life, one person's having the best time of their life, and some other people are kind of in between. And I think that's kind of what's going on right now because until you're able to experience something, it's really hard to understand how risky it is. I kind of take back to back in the day when uh, elevators were first uh, basically deployed and all elevators had an operator on them to help operate the elevator for people. Um, there was a sense of trust that, okay, at least there's an operator here uh, who's going to handle this automatic staircase, right? And I think that we have to expect that with automated vehicles is we're going to have to give some people some really basic experience with them before they're going to be able to trust them. And I will say, if I had you guys ride in an automated vehicle with me uh, here on the smart road, or maybe you'll ride in one in a city and they're going to be deployed as taxis probably that go slow as the first ones. What you find out is that this is pretty uneventful. You basically get in a car, it takes you from A to B, all the while going the speed limit, which no people do for the most part, and then you get out and that's it. It's pretty uneventful. Um, when these cars are going to be driving themselves, the car companies are gonna be the ones that are liable because if the car is the driver and you own the car, have created the car, then you're the ones that are essentially ensuring its safety for everybody. So they are not going to be programming these things to be breaking the law unless it's for safety. For example, having to go across the yellow line because somebody is pulled out in front of you or something like that. So uh, it becomes quite uneventful uh, when you ride in one that's been programmed to operate uh, safely. So public perception is, is a fun, fun time. I'm not sure if you guys remember this but this there's study I did back in 2017 was we worked with Ford to do a study where we put a seemingly driverless vehicle up in Washington DC in Northern Virginia. And what we did was we hid a driver inside a seat and had them drive around. And there's about six of us that drove this vehicle around up in Washington DC. And it looked like an automated vehicle was just moving around the streets. Um, we had two goals with this. One is we were trying to evaluate new signals, and this would essentially be a new language that a robot would communicate to people on the street. And then the other one was to see how people reacted when the first automated vehicles hit the roadway. And so what happened was about, you know, we were only on the road for about a week, and NBC reporter, um, he's down there saying, brother, who are you? He chased one of my drivers down and he kind of blew the story wide. It went viral um, to find out that we were, it was actually somebody hidden inside the seat driving this around. And so that kind, of, uh, that kind of ruined our study for a few days. We had to wait a little while before we could get back up and running. Um, but it was a fun study and I'll show you a little video of that right now. Before I do actually, I'm gonna change one thing. All right, hopefully you'll be able to hear this too. Brother, who are you? What are you doing?
So that's fun, right? <laughs> So we did that study and that made it viral and got us, I don't know, 250 news articles and media hits around the world. And that got uh, some people's attention. Um, Car and Driver magazine had Malcolm Gladwell basically do a guest series in their magazine uh, around advanced vehicles. And it went, it, it went so smoothly that Car and Driver magazine hired Alex Horwitz, who's the director of Hamilton's America and some other documentaries, to do a documentary on autonomy and had Malcolm Gladwell executive produce it. So they came here to, to Blacksburg, they filmed us, they put us in the movie, and I got to bring Tom Dingus, who's our director, down to the South by Southwest Film Festival as well as the Virginia Film Festival. We got to meet a lot of the people, got a spot in the movie. It was very cool. Um, this documentary is now available on quite a few platforms. So you guys are oh, be able to see no, it for not, sure now on Amazon Prime Video. You can see it on Hulu. Um, I think um, some other ones like Google Play, I think, um, YouTube. And so I can always provide you guys those links if you want to see it. But I will show you a quick trailer of the, the documentary. They did it as a feature film rather than a scientific um, documentary. And I think it does justice to really sitting down, enjoying a documentary for an hour that really gets you in the mind of every kind of person in the US and around the world and how it might be useful and some of the fears and concerns about it too. So instead of me going through and teaching you all about this, uh, I think this is also a really nice film that you will enjoy. You can sit down and, and kind of when you're left and when you're done is really contemplate what you think um, on your own terms. So I'll show you the, uh, the trailer here. Driving is an extraordinarily satisfying activity for those who choose to invest in it. Now we're at the dawn of driverless cars and we're about to redefine that dramatically. And as we give over control of our mobility, we may be giving over more than we realize. That's what we're looking at for the future of cars. I remember when this was science fiction and here we are. I thought technical objects could have a sense of vision and do their own decisions. People thought I'm crazy. Oh dear Jesus, I could never, ah! Now autonomous truck's gonna take my job. I just don't think we're ready for it yet. No matter what, there will always be nostalgists. They wanna live in a log cabin and drive a 74 Camaro. <laughs> we didn't evolve to spend an hour and a half every day sitting in a metal box. This is technology to give people back time. The question is how much will we allow machines to screw up? What is our threshold for that? There are significant costs to the individual and significant benefits to society at large. There's a lot to be excited about and you need to know what's coming. Yeah, come on, that was freaking awesome. Let's see the autonomous car do that. So, <clears throat> I recommend you go ahead and watch that documentary. I think it, it takes it from every viewpoint and really kind of serves up in a really entertaining way where we were, how we got where we are, and what we're trying to move forward with. And a big portion of where we're going is that because these cars are so expensive with all the technologies that are on them, is that these car companies and tech companies are trying to deploy robo taxis, automated taxis first, because they can focus them in inside a city under a very defined space so that they can train them to only work in that environment in good weather and create a business model around it. These cars can drive all day long. Once in a while they need to charge, but what they can do is they have a business model that will help to support deploying autonomous vehicles. And as they do that, they can learn more and more about making them to where people can buy them and trying to get them more cost um, effective. 
And so we'll first see these in cities and urban environments in very dedicated regions before we'll really start to see them as just being able to buy them like any other car. But to get us to that stage, we're pretty sure that these vehicles are gonna to have to operate at like a commercial airline reliability when it becomes to being acceptable for being safe. Um, we're gonna to need to get them to a point where they can drive across state lines and figure out how to handle the different laws and roadways that are in different states and regions. They're gonna to need to always operate in mixed traffic with people who are manually driving vehicles. Um, we have to get our cyber protection up pretty heavily you know, Virginia Tech has the Hume Center and we work with them on evaluating all the cyber elements of safety for these systems. And we also need to get better about understanding in real time what the driver and passengers are doing so that we can make sure that the robot vehicle is considering that in when it's driving, when it needs to turn control over. Um, and that's a really tough thing to do too. I decided to throw two more slides in here at the end just to talk about COVID-19 and the, pand the pandemic we're in um, because I think we it came up right at the beginning, right? Talking about what this has and the effect on transportation. And we do know that overall traffic volume is down right now. It's starting to return, but we're kind of unsure if it will completely return. What you have is a lot of cities and a lot of companies that are allowing more people to work from home more often and even if they do want them to come to work, they're not coming to work every day. So I have a feeling we might see a lot of places have traffic return to normal, uh, but the new normal will probably be about 10% less. Uh, preliminary estimates, we don't really know for sure, but we believe some car crashes are down, but we feel like pedestrian related events have, popped, have gone up a little bit. And what's happening with that is that there's more people out there on bikes and on their feet um, rather than just driving and commuting. And that's creating just more opportunity for them to kind of get hit or have some kind of event. I can't say for sure that that's what's going on yet. This is mostly anecdotal evidence um, because it takes a while to get all those kind of crash stats for the whole US. As far as innovation in this space, car companies have slowed activity a little bit because the industry and the economy is down too. Um, but they're, pretty, they're still pretty active in advanced vehicles and automated vehicles because they know that this is really the next jump shift in making things safer and their next jump shift in them, you know, um, innovating and evolving as a company. Uh, the federal government is definitely being very active. They're putting out a lot of requests for proposals for contract research. So there's an increase in that opportunity. Every day we're writing new proposals to try to help them answer certain, uh, certain questions that they want answered. Um, one area that's in trouble is that we think public transit is gonna be a little bit in trouble. And when I say public transit, I want you to think about buses and subways or metros. And the reason is, is that these are public-based transportation systems that require large amounts of people to get into a confined space. And so there's a lot of fear around that, um, some of it rightfully so, is that people are gonna be concerned about using that as a service um, unless there's some really rigid cleaning protocols and that everybody is able to you know, protect everybody else. So we're seeing huge drops in that and we're trying to come up with new ways to help with better airflow through buses and metros and try to come up with countermeasures and things to prevent this from happening. Um, but the ride share like Ubers and Lyfts, they're trying to come up with plexiglass dividers inside, masks and cleaning protocols. Um, but they're really focused on hopefully trying to get to automated cars so that they don't have to have a driver in there. So that you're reducing human to human exposure. As far as VTTI and what we have going on, um, half of our work has slowed down a little bit because a lot of what we do is collect data with people. So that's definitely slowed while we've come up with new protocols and wait for kind of traffic to return to normal. But the other half of our work is accelerated because all of these companies that can't really collect data right now, they're really interested in using the data we already have to try to answer some of these questions. So that half of our work is really accelerated. And so that's why VTTI is still kind of working pretty much normally with the amount of funding we have coming in. Um, and the amount of work that we have to do. 
so that's just my quick kind of report out on where things are with regards to transportation in relation to all of COVID. Uh, truck driving and the transport of our goods, um, that is still very high. I think they barely took a dip, um, very small one in the miles traveled, but that's only because you know, there's only a certain amount of workers, some of the manufacturing facilities where they get the products slowed down a little bit, but the demand for our goods is still very high. We're all in Amazon Prime world. We all want our things today or tomorrow if possible. And we all need food to make it to the hubs around the world to give us the food that we need. So um, the trucking side and transport of goods didn't really slow. Um, it was more of the citizen-based commuter population that slowed down a lot during this pandemic. And we, we anticipate it coming back to 80 to 90% of where it was. So that's my quick 50 minute presentation on what VTTI is up to. We're growing. Uh, what new facilities we have, all the data that we're into. Um, and then the other side was just on what's going on in this automated vehicle space. There's a lot of potential there. It's based in the fact that we want to be able to save some lives because we, it's been very hard. Every year our vehicle miles traveled continues to increase in the US and we're able to keep our fatality numbers fairly kind of stable. But what we'd really like to do is find a way to cut a big portion of those fatalities out. Every life we save is saving tons and tons of ang uh, anguish and, and, and problems with families that are just heartbroken from crashes. And, and, and deaths in their family. And so each one of those we strive to try to reduce. And with automation, we may have an opportunity for the first time in a long time to really take some chunks out of that. So that's what gets us up early in the morning and keeps us late here at VCTI. So with that, I would love to open it up for some questions. Yeah, I guess um, I'll start, Andy, is how does the, the U.S. compare to research in driverless technology versus maybe Europe, other countries, you know, across the world? So really a lot of the players that are in this space, um, they're global companies. So you think about Ford, General Motors, Google, um, Toyota, even the we'll call artificial intelligence companies, they're being acquired by all those big players. And so really all the countries are fairly similar, at least all the first world, um, because all they're really doing differently is trying to train the AI to be able to drive the roads in which the, the country is of target. Um, so I would say it's all very pretty similar in the first world side of things, the major countries, Europe, um, ourselves, and then elsewhere, it's not as important for them to deploy in those areas because there's not a business model for that yet. So it's really around the areas where there's economies, there's lots of people in urban environments that are gonna be the, where, where it's all being deployed. But overall, I would say these first world countries um, are all very similar because the companies have headquarters and bases in all of them. That may yeah. Heather, did you have a question? I did have a question. Um, I was curious. I've read some articles where they've said that um, sensors and cameras and facial recognition are better at detecting lighter skin tones, mm -hmm. and there's a higher um, error rate for darker skin tones. Could you talk about some of the research um, the Institute is doing to correct that? Sure, it's, it's very challenging. Um, I've done testing on fatigue monitoring systems, drowsy driver systems, distraction systems, and really you can bundle these all up into the term driver monitoring systems. And they use vision very much. I call it vision, it's camera-based vision to look and then basically try to I don't know what the right word is, use filters and process the image to try to find lines and create virtual masks and try to understand everything that goes on. Um, what you have trouble with are things like people's faces are so different. <laughs> There's, 
it's we're all like we're we're all snowflakes we're all unique right in uh, we're, we have our own fingerprints as far as our face so some people have very squinty eyes they're very you know very low so how do you look at the eye and look for eye droop to see if somebody's tired versus somebody whose eyes are bigger and it's an easier target um, you have issues with how bright it is inside the vehicle or how dark it is so driving at night for example it changes things now you need infrared illumination to light it up and infrared illumination is going to reflect differently off different tones of the face so it's very tough to do i'd say that the stuff that we're doing to try to help with that is that some of the problems are not solvable with just one sensor like a camera it requires you illuminating the the space differently it requires some really interesting quirks that you can't get over. It's just the hard science of it. But what we're doing is to fuse it with other sensors and figure out what the problem is. So let's say I'm looking to see if somebody's distracted. I'm gonna watch their eyes. I'm gonna watch to see if their head is in general facing forward. I'm also gonna fuse in steering wheel to find out if they're steering erratically. I'm also gonna look at lane lines to see if they're drifting in and out of the lane. And then I'm also going to look at speed. And then what we do is we fuse all those together to create an algorithm that helps compensate for the fact that we have a tough job identifying what somebody's face is doing. Uh, another thing is glasses and sunglasses. That throws things off drastically too. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm a vampire most of the time. If I'm outside, I have to have big sunglasses on. Um, so it is challenging. And it's kind of crazy to think that in some way these systems are kind of discriminatory um, and prejudice on some elements, but it's just because of the science involved with trying to do it and do it well. So I will say that none of automation isn't relying on us being very good at driver monitoring, but it's something we are trying to get a lot better at because if we are able to do that, we would be able to very much better determine and predict what's going on in the car and make it safer. So we're definitely trying a lot of things. So you were talking about the driver, um, which is great, really interesting information. I guess I was thinking about the passenger, I mean, the uh, pedestrian who might get hit by the car. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. Well, I will say that they're not, all of these systems aren't really looking directly to the face. They are mm -hmm. looking for general head direction, if they can, but they're mostly looking at whole body movements and trying to predict, is that person gonna just step out into the middle of the road right now or are they just reaching for their phone? Um, so it's more holistic kind of body movement that they're looking at and trying to come up with predictions based on how many of times they've seen humans do those same things. And then we've done it, I've spent, I don't know how many thousands of hours looking in, at video of people's heads to see if they're looking forward, looking at least towards us. We can't identify their eyes, it's really hard to do from far away unless we were zoomed really far in. So it's less about the eyes and facial elements, it's more about this whole body position that they're trying to come up with. But if you ask like Torque Robotics, um, they're next door, the spinoff out of Virginia Tech, Michael Fleming will say, um, they're, the most complex thing they're trying to do is do pedestrian prediction. It's the hardest one to do for sure. Um, if they dialed it in to be very safe, Every time somebody moved their hand, arms while sitting on a corner, the vehicle would probably lock up and stop, right? Mm -hmm. um, because that's almost the same motion as it is if somebody would just step out. So he, what I liked what Torque Robotics did was they were driving their vehicles around Las Vegas for a couple of years. And I lived in Las Vegas for a couple of years. And if you want to just look at the most unpredictable, unpredictable pedestrian population in the world, just go drive around Las Vegas in the strip in the middle of the night and just see what people will do. And so if you're going to test and train your automated vehicles, put them in the toughest environment you can while they're learning. Um, it's, it's not as much about, put, it's not like your kids where you want to put them in a dangerous environment. But if you're training an automated car, it's okay to do that. It looks like we had another uh, question in the chat. Um, Manisha had asked, how far behind are other car makers in automatic driving compared to Tesla? So, and especially because we're being recorded, I will say that I can't answer that directly. <laughs> we may or may question. not be working with all of the companies. <laughs> and so uh, it's probably not best to rank them. 
Um, but I will say that some of them are further ahead than others. Uh, some of them have more aggressive approaches. Some of them are really focused on the long-term safety run. And so when you look at companies like tech companies, they're used to deploying software out there in the world before it's done and then putting all of you users to try them out. And then that's how they learn to make it better. That's one culture. And that very much kind of started when these tech companies started playing in this space of let's try things out and work really fast. It's agile, it's a lean approach. Whereas the car companies on the other side, they would take five to nine years to develop and produce safety tests and then deploy their vehicles. Years and years and years versus the other side, which is well, let's do it within a year. Since that time, what's happened is that the tech companies have realized, okay, we can't do this as fast as we wanted to. This is actually a hard thing. And then they learned about physics too. Yeah, heavy cars moving at heavy, high, high speeds, that's pretty dangerous. It's not the same as software. But the car companies who are in this different industry, they realized they needed to speed up a bit. Otherwise, the tech, they were gonna be at danger that the tech companies would really disrupt their industry. So they've sped up their development a little bit. So what you're seeing is starting to be a compromise in the middle where they're all starting to get along a little bit more. And what you're seeing, if you watch this space, is these car companies or truck companies are actually buying the tech companies. And then I call it hugging. They're starting to hug and become partners in this venture rather than compete against each other. Um, and that's what happened with Torque Robotics. Daimler Truck from Germany, they bought the uh, majority stake of Torque Robotics. And now they're partnered together to try to go after the challenges one so that they can leverage the safety side, the regulatory side, that culture, and at the same time, let the tech companies do what they do best and accelerate innovation as fast as possible. And then those two together will make sure that it's safe to deploy. So it's a great question. Um, and I can't answer it any more specifically than that. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Hold on a second. Uh, yep. Go ahead. I think um, I'm trying to unmute you. Um, I, I did. I just did. Okay. On your test cars, um, do you have different age groups driving them? Like old people like us? <laughs> absolutely. You're Most not old, us. Virginia. Don't say that, Virginia. <laughs> we absolutely do. We have uh, a huge participant database that we sign people up for. We do older driver research, senior driver research, teen driver research, all in the middle. Um, and so what we can do is, and I can send this along, we have a spot on our website where you can call if you just prefer to call a phone number and talk to our team and they'll ask you some questions and put you into the database. And then when a study comes up that needs a specific demographic, demographic of people, then they go ahead and call you and try to schedule a time for you to come in and try some things out. So absolutely, we, uh, we couldn't do what we do without volunteers and we compensate everybody as well. So it's not just getting to come drive in a car, but you know, you'll get anywhere from 15 to $30 an hour to just come play <laughs> on our playground. <laughs> yeah, my husband's one of those, one of the jack drivers. He loves it. Yeah, it's, we appreciate it for sure. Gloria? Uh, uh, my friend here has a question. Andy, I wanted to ask you, and I'm coming from the aerospace direction, uh, commercial aviation has become uh, cockpit-wise highly automated, and there's a backlash now about training, training of pilots and understanding of what's going on and recognition if things don't seem normal. Have you any thoughts about that? I mean, in 10 years when your technology say is widely used, will driver training be different? Will licensing requirements be different? What a great question. Yeah, you nailed it. So I, I did some aviation work. I, I worked on head-up displays um, yeah. for my master's thesis uh, for the Air Force. And all everything we're doing is called human factors. We're doing that in the transportation field. Um, the only other field that's still trying to catch up is healthcare. That's a, also a funky spot with regards to designing for humans. But you're absolutely right. Right now, think about driver education that we have in our country. You do it once when you're like 15 or 16. It's likely, you know, the driver's ed teacher as far as the school probably is also 
um, the coach for PE or somebody who, you know, it's one person who's been doing it with the same curriculum forever. And then nobody gets educated again after that, unless they've gotten tickets and the court has asked them to go to a safety class. That's kind of not the whole proactive approach we probably want. So although graduated driver's licensing and stuff as a teenager has gotten better, we have no mechanism for educating people on these new vehicles. So what's happening right now is that dealerships, there's starting to be some talk of policy and requirements that before you're out allowed to drive a vehicle off the lot after you bought it is that you have to go through some training procedures, some videos in the vehicle and figure out how these systems work. Um, what we're finding though is that they're not all doing that. Um, when you rent a car, let's say you guys both go to the beach and so you decide to rent a car for that trip and all of a sudden while you're driving, it's doing automated things. That's happening. It's like bumping you back on the road and you're thinking, what is wrong with this car? You're not educated to it and that can actually create unintended consequences. So we have a um, tremendous amount of proposals out right now for, uh, with the US DOT to see if we can help with that to show really seamless ways that we can educate people if, uh, if they don't know how their car should work. Um, and the other problem is, is that, especially if you're buying a used car, there's no dealership. So there wouldn't be any requirements. So we're trying to figure out a way to embed a training system in these cars so that before they drive it, it recognizes you're a new driver. And then it says, okay, here's what we want you to know. And here's some practice we want you to go through with the technology here before you drive the vehicle. So that's what we're hoping for. Uh, but it's a brand new space for what you brought up. And I, it's very, very intuitive of you to bring that up. I think it's, it's going to be a tough challenge. Thank you. Anybody else? Any other uh... Any other questions for Andy? During the middle of the break, you could try the car. No, it doesn't look like it. If you want, if you need to, just raise your hand. I'm still figuring out this mute and unmute. But <laughs> okay, well, I think those are all the questions. Um, I think just if we can, um, I'd like to thank Andy for. The wonderful presentation. I think it's really, really some fascinating information on th what the research is that you're you're doing there, and just everything you're involved in. I think it's great to have that Virginia Tech, and we appreciate your time sharing that with us today. Glad to. Um, always happy to answer questions after the fact. If anybody wants to ship them through Lisa and let me know, I'd be happy to answer them. And you know, just continue to be Hokie Nation and, and participate in our studies if you can. I think that would be great. Um, other than that, just try to keep an open mind for what we're doing. We're definitely not trying to come up with automated vehicles because we're super bored. Um, we do love cars. We're car culture, of course. That's what we get excited about, but we really are trying to make them safe. And so staying open-minded to it and helping us kind of figure it out. We'll make sure they're not deployed when they shouldn't be. Um, but until then, we're going to continue to research it as safely as possible, and we'll do it right here in the NRV. Uh, this is, we're the largest group of driving safety researchers in the world now, and that's right here in Blacksburg. It's kind of cool. So mm -hmm. thanks for letting me talk to all of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you for setting it up, Lisa. Yep, no problem. <laughs> Take care. Have Thanks, a great day. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Thanks, Sandy.